Our scripture reading comes from the gospel according to Luke, uh, chapter 19, verse number 1. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give back to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. May God bless the reading, may God bless the hearing of this word, and may we hear in it a word that is to us and for us on this day. I thought about giving this All Saints Day sermon the title, The Lies We Tell at Funerals. <laughs> Have you ever had the experience of attending a funeral? at which the officiant, when eulogizing the deceased, described a person so saintly, so above reproach, that the people in the congregation had to do a double take at the bulletin to make sure they were at the right funeral. <laughs> Their confusion arising from the fact that the listeners couldn't reconcile the description of the deceased with the life they had witnessed as it was lived. When I was very early in my ministry, I had a gentleman in our congregation who was the kind of person a pastoral care professor described as the reason you earn a paycheck. <laughs> I'm going to call him John Smith for today's purposes, okay? He and his family had, had been in the church for generations, and the longevity of their tenure at the church had given him a sense of ownership. And after I'd been there only a few months, he said to me, I've seen plenty of preachers like you come and go. He had an incredibly significant presence in the church, but quite often it was for all the wrong reasons. He was quick to criticize anything and everyone, and when the younger generation of the church came up with ideas, he had a special talent for shooting them down, and all the reasons that they would fail and be a waste of the church's resources. He, if he was against something, and well, he was against almost everything, those on the other side of the, of the discussion just you know, quickly gave in because knew that he would get his way. He was old enough that it was not hard to discern that he wouldn't be a presence in the church forever, but I tell you, I never prayed to be free of him. In fact, quite the contrary. I bargained with the Lord to keep him alive till I was gone so that I didn't have to preach the funeral. <laughs> it, it was a country singer, Garth Brooks, though, who made famous a song named Unanswered Prayers. And you might say that my prayer fell into that category. He passed away uh, while I was still the pastor there. Well, it was a challenge, but I highlighted every good quality that I knew him to have, and he did, have, and he had some. I even imagined some good qualities that were underneath that rough exterior, and I, and, and I, and I spoke to them. I embellished some, and, well, I left some stuff out. When I was finished, I was reasonably pleased with the, with, with the work I had done and received some positive comments from uh, those in attendance. But there's this one sort of uh, sweet-spirited, dry-witted lady in the congregation, and she said, that was a mighty nice man you described. But before they throw one pile of dirt on that casket, I want them to open it up because I thought it was John Smith inside. On All Saints Day, we have an opportunity to admit some things about our relationships with people, which are hard to admit at a funeral. While there often are so many wonderful and life-giving elements to those relationships, many of our, the most important relationships uh, and influential relationships in our lives are filled with complexities. In fact, if we look closely at the fabric of those important relationships, we see that it is the, the stitches of grace 
and forgiveness that hold the pieces together. Moreover, when it comes to people, including you and I, it has never seemed terribly appropriate to me to say that somebody is better than they seem or worse than they seem. I think it's enough to say that we're all more than we seem. There's more than this just appears on the surface. And such was the case of Zacchaeus, the wee little man uh, who was the subject of a children's song that I still remember from Sunday school and who we meet again in today's gospel lesson. Zacchaeus' story is pretty well documented among churchgoers. He was a tax collector. And I suppose even in the best of circumstances, tax collectors aren't going to win any popularity contest. But in his place and in his world, it meant being a Hebrew employed by the Roman government to collect taxes from fellow Hebrews. And they made their living by overcharging for the taxes, sometimes in great fashion. So in the ancient Middle Eastern world, tax collectors were notorious beings, hated and despised. And this is why tax collectors were held in synonymous regard to sinners. When people wished to levy a charge against Jesus, as they did in this text, they would say he associates with sinners and tax collectors. There was a name for people like Zacchaeus and those like him, as well as for Jesus because he associated with people like Zacchaeus. It is a name which has survived to this day and is still used to describe the kind of folk we don't want to become and who we think we're nothing like. I've used the name and I bet you have used the name. We use it to describe the people whose sins and shortcomings are clearly worse than our own. We use it to describe those whose way of being, way of living, way of speaking, maybe way of voting, whose ways are so different than our own in fundamental important ways that we need one name to sum them all up and put them in the right category. Anybody know what that name is? Be careful. The friends. <laughs> Now, those people, that's the, those people, <laughs> you know how those people are. You know the problems those people cause. You know how much progress we could make in this world if it wasn't for those people. <laughs> Zacchaeus was one of those people, but What if the point of this story isn't that Zacchaeus was a bad person turned good because of his encounter with Jesus? What if, as the passage concludes with the words, the Son of Man came to save the lost, the lost one in this story isn't Zacchaeus, but is instead the people who think they have him and others pegged and have neatly divided the world into us and them. Us and them. And those people. And before I offer another word, let me offer you what is only an opinion. The most imminent threat to our existence as people and to the prospects of us flourishing as the people of this earth. The most imminent threat to that is the division of all its inhabitants into us and them, our people, and those people. But back to the story. I've always felt that the the use of the original language of the Bible, the, the Hebrew, the Greek, the Aramaic, is important to use in sermon preparation, but it's best used in the room of preparation and not overstated in the actual practice of preaching. If not careful, the preacher will come across as if he or she is trying to remind the congregation that he or she has a degree hanging on their wall, a diploma hanging on their wall, or in my case, in a box somewhere, I'm just not sure. (laughs) Stephanie, in an effort to compliment me, has often said that I have a gift for dumbing things down. To which I always reply, that's concerning because I'm trying to sound as smart as I know how. (laughs) (laughs) 
But in this case, the original language of the text is important. The original Greek of the text is important. It's important contrasted with its translation into English, and it's too important to ignore in this case. The translation in the New Revised Standard Version, which I read today in verses 8 and 9, read this way. Half my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. If I have defrauded anyone, I will pay them back four times as much. In that reading, it sounds like an act of repentance, like something Zacchaeus has been inspired to do because of this encounter with, with Jesus and you're promising to, to live differently in the future. The problematic piece of the translation, however, is that the original language, in the original language, the verbs that Zacchaeus uses aren't in the future tense, but they're in the present tense. And here's what I'm after here. The reading, a cleaner reading, would be this. I give half my wealth to the poor. And if I find I have defrauded anyone, I pay back four times as much. Because of his vocation, the people in the story believe that Zacchaeus is a cheat, he's a scoundrel, he's a traitor to his own people, and that he is the worst of sinners. But in reality, it may well be that he is already practicing a life of generosity that far exceeds any of them. Seen in this light, this story is a call to repentance, but not a call to repentance for those people, those poor lost people, those poor confused people. It is instead an invitation to live differently and to cease with the madness, the utter madness of dividing the entire planet into our people and those people. Like Zacchaeus, there is more to all of us than meets the eye. And only in seeing past the surface of things, only in seeing past our prejudgment, can we identify the common threads of humanity and the hope which unite us as a human race. Now, it may appear as if I have forgotten entirely that it's All Saint Sunday, and I've instead chosen to chase a rabbit down a path that liberal preachers like me seem to like. I haven't forgotten, however, our purpose on this day. Instead, I want us to take this name back, those people. I want us to take it back. That name, those people, has become such a paralyzing force in our efforts toward progress and, and growth. On this day, I want us to remember that our lives haven't been influenced by perfect people. Instead, they have been influenced, shaped, and made rich by complex people, complex saints. And we have to come to know so that we now, as complex saints, are left to influence, shape, and make rich the lives of those who we journey with. So let's talk about those people in a different way. Let's talk about those people who we have gathered to remember today. Last year, during this same observance, I shared a list with you of the kinds of people we might turn our attention to today. And several of you seemed to like it and, and offered me a few thoughts of your own. And so I'm going to use it one more time with just a few revisions. These are some saints that we will remember today. Anyone who has ever helped you believe that you could be anything and do anything that you wanted to be and do. Anyone who was a little hard on you because they saw something in you which you hadn't seen yet yourself. Anyone who was ever kind to you in a moment in which you needed kindness just to get through that day. Anyone who has ever been so funny, so silly, or just plain stupid in the best of ways that they made you laugh until you cried. Anyone who has ever, who ever went out of town on a trip with you and never talked about the things that happened while you were there. Anyone who didn't go away or turn away when just about everyone else was going away and turning away. Anyone who has ever helped you see something about the world or matters of truth which before you had refused to see. Anyone who ever said just the right words in just the right moment to get you through a dark night 
as well as anyone who knew there were no words to say, but stood there with you in the darkness anyway. Anyone who ever loaned you a truck? Anyone who ever suggested you read a book and the book turned out to be fantastic and became a lifelong friend? Any child who ever trusted you to take care of them because it's an honor? Anyone who thinks some of your imperfections are pretty cool parts of you? Anyone who taught you to love football, knitting, cooking, reading, building things, to pull for a favorite team, or anything which you still do and enjoy? Anyone who ever picked you out of a group of special people and made you feel the most special of all? Anyone who ever taught you when you were ready to learn that everyone is as special as you? Anyone who became really excited just because you walked in the room? The first person you kissed, more importantly, the last person you kissed. Anyone who ever bragged about something you had done so that you didn't have to brag about it for yourself. Anyone who was a grown-up when you were a kid but did funny things like making noises with their hand cupped under their armpit. (laughs) Any child who ever forgave you for being an imperfect person parent, or caregiver, your favorite teacher, your first ever best friend, anyone who loves you now more than they did before, anyone who helped you accomplish something you couldn't have accomplished by yourself, anyone who picked you up after you had fallen down. Anyone who ever taught you or or anyone who ever bought you an ice cream cone, a beer, a cup of coffee, a chili dog, or anything that gave you a moment of enjoyment. Anyone who wouldn't let you be alone when being alone was what you demanded, but was the last thing you needed. Anyone who laughed with you and never laughed at you, except in those rare moments when being laughed at was what you needed to be aware of your own folly. And finally, anyone who reminded you that God is now and always will be bigger than we are. We've come together to remember them, not perfect saints. There's such a thing as a perfect saint, I know they wouldn't want to hang out with me. We come to remember the saints, those who have gone before us, those who have helped us, those who have shaped our lives. For many of those relationships, they were complex, but still life-giving. So we come together to remember. As the music plays, you are invited into a ritual of remembrance where you can bring your photos or your notes and place them here on the table as we remember those people who've made our lives rich and full of meaning.